Kwe Seko Anin, bonjour, good afternoon. Uh, I, I don't think it's morning anymore uh, from, from the West Coast. Um, <laughs> before I start, I'd like to acknowledge that I'm speaking to you today from uh, Montreal, McGill University in Montreal, uh, and the campus is situated, of course, on unceded territory. Uh, which has long served as the site of uh, meeting and exchange among indigenous peoples, including the Adinoshane and Anishinaabe nations. Um, we acknowledge and thank them for the footsteps that, that have marked these territories on which uh, we gather, uh, albeit virtually today. Uh, I also want to thank uh, the organizers of the conference. I found it riveting all day. Uh, it's been a real uh, treat to, to, to be uh, listening in. Um, so thank you to Pat Patricia Paradis, if you're listening to us, and Zara for the, the, the logistics, which I think are quite uh, uh, stellar. Um, and and uh, thank you for bringing this, you know, these, these groups of people to make us think about the last 40 years of constitutional history. And I kept thinking, has it been 40 years? Because it felt very vivid. Uh, for, in my personal uh, experience. Um, now, so welcome to this panel on patriation and the people. And you'll notice that people is in the singular. And I thought, oh, that's interesting. We could have thought about uh, patriation and peoples uh, as well, but it's been taken in the uh, singular and we'll see whether our speakers take it into the plural as well. So for this panel, we have three uh, great speakers, Penny Bryden, who teaches political science and particularly constitutional history at the University of Victoria. And I know that Petty, Penny is working on uh, a project called Dirty Money in Secret Sex towards a scandal in Canada. So I don't know whether we'll, we'll hear about scandals in the context of uh, patriation. Um, Andrew Parkin is executive director of Environix Institute. Um, a nonprofit agency that conducts in, um, public opinion polls on major issues uh, shaping Canada's future. And Alain Gagnon is a professor of science politique at l'UCAM, the University of Quebec, à Montréal, uh, where he holds a Canada chair uh, in Quebec in Canadian studies. Uh, so. Um, from from their brief uh, abstracts, you will have noticed that Penny will sort of capture uh, the mood of the people during patriation and a little bit after. And um, Andrew and Alain will take it from there and basically uh, address how people have are still engaging or not uh, with uh, our constitutional architecture and the, the power plays between different actors. Uh, since since then, in the last 40 years. So we have one hour, and I'm hoping for at least a good 15 minutes uh, of conversation after. So uh, I will be a little uh, vigilant about time, uh, 15 minutes maximum, Alain and, Alain and, um, and Andrew 10. I will be holding cards if need be. I don't think I will, but yellow to warn you that it's coming to an end, and red to ask you to conclude, if ever. Um, you're too enthusiastic. Okay, so um, so let's start. Penny, the mic is yours, and thank you. Thank you very much. I, I'm not sure I'll be able to live up to any expectations of scandal or even a, a very clear view of what it was that anybody was thinking about patriation. But um, I've I've thought of this paper as bringing the public back in. Uh, a nod to uh, Theta Scotch Pole's uh, efforts at bringing the state back in. N now I'd like to bring the people back in. Um, so in the early weeks of 2022, thousands of protesters wielding hundreds of trucks effectively shut down Ottawa's parliamentary district over opposition to vaccine mandates, the continuation of the COVID-19 pandemic and its heavy financial toll, and a variety of often contradictory irritations with the governing Liberals. Protesters had disparate goals. Weekend picketers enjoyed the party atmosphere that food trucks, bouncy castles, and horn honking created, while the so-called Freedom Convoy organizers called for the overthrow of the government. What united the crowd was its use of quasi-constitutional language to frame its protests brandishing charter guarantees of amorphous freedoms as they railed against restrictions. What's interesting here is not the selective use of various charter protections, the remarkable misunderstanding of the Canadian parliamentary system, 
or even the unprecedented use of the Emergencies Act to clear the protests, but rather the very fact that the Constitution Act 1982 has been embraced so completely by the citizens of Canada. A protest in the 1870s over property and civil rights or over the power of disallowance, even if the protesters had profoundly misunderstood the meaning of either of those constitutional sections, would have been unthinkable outside a courtroom. A century and a half later, however, the constitutional framework of the nation is considered a tool or a weapon at everyone's disposal. Setting aside for now the concern that misuse of constitutional rights, like misuse of the flag, can sap the meaning from the words, this paper examines the early history of the popularization of the Constitution Act 1982. It shows how the process of patriation itself lured a reluctant public into the constitutional fold and how they then got written into the story how the very Americanization of politics bemoaned by some commentators opened up new avenues of behavior for the public and how the public came to study, celebrate and promote the constitution that marked its 40th birthday this week. So to bring the public into the constitution, I, I wanna look first at the, at the early stages. Little about the process of constitutional negotiations seems inherently interesting to the broader public beyond the political legal community. And for decades, the process unfolded in ways that underlined this perceived truism. From the behind the scenes haggling in Charlottetown and Quebec City, where even public acknowledgement of conferences was hard to find, to the tedium of Canada's first serious post-war effort at securing an amending formula in the 1950s, the process of constitutional change in Canada has been characterized more by a lack of public interest than by the reverse. There's always been some undercurrents of interest. As Peter Price has recently shown, the magazine contributors in the 19th century often wrestled with ideas that sprang from the constitutional agreement of 1867. Ideas like nationality uh, and loyalty and citizenship and even constitution itself. Later efforts to either analyze the constitution like in the massive for the time Royal Commission uh, on Dominion Provincial Relations in the late 1930s, or test its elasticity, like with the person's case in the 1920s, or with the implied Bill of Rights cases involving Jehovah's Witnesses in Quebec in the 1950s. These elicited some enthusiasm outside the usual legal circles, but the public reach was modest. It wasn't until the arrival of mega constitutional politics, defined by Peter Russell as an approach to constitutional reform that put everything on the table and is, quote, concerned with reaching agreement on the identity and fundamental principles of the body politic, that we begin to see public interest in the process, indeed almost implicit in Russell's description of mega constitutional politics as, quote, exceptionally emotional and intense, is a degree of public participation. That participation began in 1860, sorry, <laughs> began in 1967. The Confederation of Tomorrow Conference called by Ontario Premier John Robarts to determine what Quebec wants vis-a-vis -vis confederation and the federal system was designed as a showcase. Like other constitutional conferences that had preceded it, part of the idea was to showcase, at least internally, the various positions of political participants. This conference, called in Canada's centennial year, also anticipated a public role. Held on the 54th floor of the new Toronto Dominion Centre, the conference would be televised, showcasing not only the panoramic views and architectural advances in downtown Toronto, but also the forward-thinking constitutional innovation of the premiers. While there was some doubt about the logistics of broadcasting the events, there seemed to have been little doubt that the public would be interested in tuning in uh, to opening and closing statements. And in fact, Daniel Johnson's opening proposals for fundamental constitutional change, while meeting a faint response from the other premiers, certainly attracted the attention of the press, with headlines referencing a clash with Robarts and quoting Johnson as saying, I can't stop separatism. The Quebec Premier twice read into the record his displeasure with the coverage he was receiving in the Toronto press. 
it's clear that the premiers were just beginning to practice the art of public constitutionalizing. The public, however, was also beginning to develop an appetite for the clashes, real or imagined, that such negotiations offered. So as early as 1967, the public was being invited into the constitutional process. First, they came as observers, spectators to the spectacle that successive rounds of negotiations became. But after the failure of the Victoria Charter, the decade of haphazard attempts at constitutional reform that followed, the threat of unilateral patriation, and the entangling of the Supreme Court in the constitutional show, the public was either entirely hooked on the drama or exhausted. During the final push for agreement, however, the public became weaponized in a way that had not been the case before. That was possible in large part because of the decade and a half of observation that had already occurred. As has been well documented and much debated, a fact that in itself demonstrates the fascination that people have increasingly shown regarding all things constitutional, the process of constitutional change that began with the Confederation of Tomorrow Conference eventually ended up back in Ottawa during the first week of November, 1981. Insiders have documented the exchanges between various members of the Group of Eight, Trudeau and the premiers of Ontario and New Brunswick at length. While there is some disagreement as to when and how the idea of referendum entered the discussions, there is no doubt that it did. According to the version offered by Roy Romano, John White and Howard Leeson, quote, an astonishing new alliance was suddenly formed when Levesque accepted in principle Trudeau's idea of a referendum. Others, including Roy McMurtry in his lengthy recollection of the process and in his later memoirs, identify the moment that Levesque voiced his support for Trudeau's constitutional referendum as the betrayal of the agreement among the group of eight and the catalyst for the subsequent agreement. Every other public version of the events of the week that was in Ottawa in November 1981 includes the offer of a national referendum and most identify that as a turning point in negotiations. The referendum gambit was now part of the constitutional narrative and with it, the people moved from their seats as spectators into the actual constitutional ring. The public became constitutional negotiators that day before a final agreement was reached. Even the Quebec public had been used, although no one had done so wittingly. Now a part of the process, the public quickly came to be seen as part of the document itself. Alan Cairns developed a theory of constitutional significance on the run, as he says, in and around the time of patriation. The resulting citizen's constitution theory posits that the inclusion of the Charter of Rights and Freedoms in the Constitution Act to 1982 had a profound impact on, first, the women, Indigenous groups and minorities, or Charter Canadians, who were brought into the constitutional fold through the Charter, and second, on the, quote, constitutional culture of English Canada, which was suffused with a participant ethic and a sense of connection to and identification with the Constitution. Indeed, in most considerations of the growth of an enthusiastic constitutional culture in Canada, the Charter is given pride of place. It's hard to argue against the importance of the Charter in tying Canadians to the Constitution, in offering an entry point for constitutional embrace. I see myself here, we say, so I am part of this document. So in a relatively short period of time, Canadians went from being spectators to a process of constitutional renewal to being used as de facto negotiators within that process to seeing themselves as part of the very document itself. But apart from the embrace of a role through the Charter, have Canadians in the years since 1982 felt part of the larger Constitution Act? Is constitutional culture in Canada purely a product of becoming charter Canadians, in Alan Cairns's phrase, or is it based on something broader? Using some of the sorts of evidence that Michael Kamen considered in his study of the evolution of American constitutional culture, I think the answer is that constitutional culture in Canada is really quite broadly based now. 
In the years after patriation, Canadians moved towards a much deeper engagement with the Constitution Act 1982 than simply applying car uh, charter protections, in turns studying, celebrating, and promoting the new constitutional framework. So to look at those in turn, um, the new constitution clearly offered law students fresh avenues of study. So it should come as no surprise that in the years following 1982, there grew a small library of new resources on constitutional law. Political science departments also embraced the field, but where we find more sudden and perhaps more surprising growth is within history departments. Of course, content is difficult, if not impossible, to determine, but calendar entries suggest a burgeoning interest in the Constitution and in constitutional history in the 1980s and 1990s. Out of 10 English language universities of varying sizes, six offered courses dedicated to Canadian constitutional history in the 1980s or 1990s that had not been that had been developed since the 1970s. In other words, the courses were not on the books in the decade prior to patriation, but appeared within the decade after. The University of British Columbia, for example, um, uh, offers one piece of uh, or, or one example of a course such as this: History 420: Evolution of the Canadian Constitution concentrates on the evolution of parliamentary government since the late 18th century, federal provincial relations since confederation, and civil liberties in the 20th century. Contemporary constitutional art issues are examined in historical perspective. Vague, um, but nevertheless, uh, a course that didn't exist prior to the 1980s. High school curricula sim similarly began to consider the constitution as an appropriate avenue of inquiry. In 1978, for example, the Ontario High School curriculum did not include a text explicitly dealing with Canadian constitutional law, although the topic was presumably addressed in some brief way in texts dealing with Western Civ or Canadian history more generally. By 1995, law had moved into the curriculum with Roland Case's text, Thinking About Law, um, which included a section on constitutional development in Canada. While the Charter may have offered the impetus to broader societal interests in constitutional issues, the appearance in less predictable places, like history programs and high schools, suggests a deeper constitutional culture. Celebrating is also apparent. The Constitution Act 1982 certainly doesn't generate the sort of fireworks and barbecue festivities that the anniversary of the enactment of the BNA Act warrants. April 17th isn't the same as July 1st. Nevertheless, unlike other moments of constitutional history, the enactment of the Statute of Westminster or the end of appeals to the JCPC, for example, patriation does evoke a certain degree of either reminiscence or celebration. This conference is clearly one example. There have been countless others at 10, 20, and 30, but presumably quite a few, and presumably quite a few in the off years. Commemorating and its sibling considering also occurs in the pages of periodic press, where an older constitutional culture has been traced by Peter Price in the 19th century. Maclean, Saturday Night, Queen's Quarterly, Chatelaine, Canadian Business, all the national newspapers and scores of other periodicals all ran articles or series of articles commemorating one of the first 10 anniversaries of patriation and all then fielded and reproduced letters to the editor or, or opinion pieces from readers. The Constitution Act 1982 encouraged engagement, in part because, because of the inclusion of the Charter, in part because of the perceived exclusion of Quebec, but often for other reasons as well. Entrenching equalization, for example, has animated conversation at times, most recently in Alberta, um, but in an early, earlier period in the Atlantic provinces. Senate reform has been broached during these public commemorations of patriation, as is the role of the Crown. In short, patriation provided a serviceable moment during which larger conversations about constitutional conventions, amendments, and constraints could be discussed. Promoting. Uh, Canadians may be local colonizers, but internationally the tendency has been towards moralizing rather than proselytizing. This has always been particularly pronounced in issues of foreign policy, where Canadians seem rarely to have strayed far from the finger-wagging that characterized the Canadian delegation to the United to the League of Nations. 
But in the last decades of the 20th century, the Constitution became a small player in that moralizing impulse. After his success with patriation, Pierre Trudeau was done. A key life goal accomplished, there was little else for him to do. But a series of events, including a meeting with Ronald Reagan, the shooting down of Korean Airlines Flight 007, and the approaching end of his own mandate, all conspired to push Trudeau into one last project. What came to be known as the Trudeau Peace Initiative has attracted relatively little attention from scholars, although the news media in Canada and in stops along his global tour all covered the peace initiative enthusiastically. As an elder statesman and a Canadian, a man of peace, according to Reagan, he brought some credentials to the task. But the constitutional agreement achieved the previous year was also a topic of discussion between Trudeau and world leaders. It was certainly not a constitutional tour, but success in one field influenced Trudeau's reception in another. He had achieved agreement on something contentious at home, so might be able to achieve something similar, a step towards nuclear dis disarmament abroad. The constitution was not part of the formal preparations for the tour, but at least in some of the global capitals, notably in India and in the United States, the constitution was part of the informal discussions. Um, did, though, his success in one area push world leaders towards considering a documentary response to the peace initiative, a collective communique? Possibly. While the Constitution and the peace initiative were certainly linked in Trudeau's mind, one goal accomplished, another to attempt, he was not spreading constitutional insights to the world in 1983. That they may have been offered informally during some of his meetings suggests a collateral opportunity within the peace initiative rather than a primary goal. A decade later, that had changed. No longer just an ancillary topic of conversation during global tours, Canada's expertise in and experience with constitutional design had achieved international recognition. No longer just studied or celebrated at home, the Constitution Act 1982 had become the credential that others were seeking. Most significantly, in 1992, the South Africa-Canada Program on Governance brought Canadian civil service expertise to a South Africa transitioning out of apartheid. Of particular importance was Canada's expertise in intergovernmental relations, intergovernmental fiscal relations, machinery of government, budget and planning at the center, and improvement of the legislative process, and knowledge of administration in provincial legislatures. Canada's international reputation, burnished by patriation, had moved beyond the informal discussion of constitution making that accompanied Trudeau's tour to the central purpose of the five-year collaboration with the South African government of Nelson Mandela. In fact, during the 1990s, when Canadians at home grew ever more exhausted by the constitutional process, the international perspective on the Constitution Act 1982 grew increasingly favorable. Constitutional expertise had had become an export with willing buyers around the world. So in conclusion, the process of negotiating patriation with its long public fitful conferences reaching back into the 1960s, its weaponization of the public through the, through the referendum gambit, and its inclusion of the protection of individual rights and freedoms through the charter, all combined to provide an invitation to the Canadian public into the constitutional environment. Whereas an earlier public rarely demonstrated any great constitutional affection and only infrequently regarded it, it as a tool at their disposal, the post-1982 public shifted toward a more embedded appreciation of the Constitution. Quickly appreciated as worthy of both celebration, muted for sure, but still celebration, study, and finally promotion on the world stage, the Patriation of the Constitution Act 1982 gave Canadians the opportunity to build and experience a constitutional culture that had not existed before. Thank you. Thank you very much, Penny, for, uh, for this really, really uh, interesting and, and insightful uh, uh, presentation. I'm sure that Alain will have questions uh, about the perspective uh, in, in, the, in the discussion period. And thank you for taking the time, keeping the time. Um, okay, are we ready to move on? I am ready and I think the yes. slide should, uh, should appear. There we go. Okay, thank you, Andrew. The mic is yours. Yeah. 
Great. Okay. Thank you. Uh, thank you, everyone. And I'm glad Penny mentioned Confederation of Tomorrow because we picked up that uh, that name and stole the logo uh, for uh, for our study. Uh, I'm uh, uh, going to go. Uh, whoops. Quickly. Not that quickly. There we go. Um, so our presentation is in two parts. There's there's my part, which I'll go through some numbers, and then there's the inst interesting part, which will, will be Alain. Um, let me just thank not only Alain and CAPCF, which is a partner with the Environics Institute in this in this project, but also three other organizations, the Center of Excellence on the Canadian Federation, the Canada West Foundation, and the Brian Mulroney Institute of Government are all partners in this, in this study. So I wanted to acknowledge um, uh, everyone's contribution. So as I said, I'm going to go quickly through some numbers. And for that reason, I'm not going to talk about methodology. And I'm just going to say there are all the details are on uh, uh, our website at the Environics Institute uh, and details not only of this study and full tables but also archived materials there's essentially 40 uh, years of public opinion information around uh, the Charter and the Constitution for anyone who wants to uh, to dig into anything so at the risk of uh, so I, I mean I'm the non-academic on the panel so my job is uh, to oversimplify so I'm going to do that in a few quick statements just to kind of convey some of the key numbers. So I'm going to start with two two bits of the of the archive material. So here's um, uh, some results from 1981 before November, but nonetheless while the dis discussions were underway. Uh, and just two quick points to convey. One is that the charter was popular uh, from the beginning. Uh, so uh, you know even before it was it was part of the constitution, it was the most pop popular part of the discussions about the constitution. And, and you can see the, the, the problem is in the federalism part of the discussion and where everyone fits in. And a lot of that came up around the amending formula and who does or does not have a veto and so on. And you, and you can see the, particularly the low level of popularity for the amending formula that was on the table at that point um, in, in Western Canada. If um, skipping ahead uh, 20 years, I, I just wanna you know, mention and, and, and in an entirely self-interested fashion, uh, that there was a study at the 20th anniversary uh, of public opinion around the Constitution and the Charter um, that I was lucky enough to uh, to lead. Um, and I just this this slide I didn't rewrite it, so this is just grabbed from my presentation that I gave 20 years ago. Um, but let me just convey it very quickly what that particular study found, which was more or less. Yes, the, I mean, the charter was hugely popular, part of Canadian identity and so on. It was particularly the equality parts of the charter. I think when Canadians think of the charter, they think of equality rights of, of various types. Uh, so uh, a lot of that study focused on civil liberties, uh, building off previous studies, people at York University and, and, and so on. Um, uh, so, you know, maybe not quite a strong support there. But this was the time particularly when academics, a number of academics anyway, were starting to write more in detail about judicial activism, possibly judicial overreach and so on. And, and essentially at that time, the, the Canadians were not concerned. As the courts started to weigh in on very controversial uh, uh, topics um, uh, that came before them because of the charter, um, uh, there was uh, general popular comfort with the role the Supreme Court was taking on uh, as a final uh, a final arbiter. Uh, lots of gray areas and nuance and so on, and I'll come back to that, but for the moment, I'm just gonna kind of move on. Now we get to the study that we just completed this January, uh, which included a number of questions around the Constitution. So uh, a lot of information here, but I'm gonna summarize it in, in three quick points. Essentially, we asked about six different possible areas where we could restart constitutional talks to make significant changes. Um, the Senate, the monarchy, the status of Quebec, the general distribution of powers, equalization, and indigenous rights. And so three observations just really, well, maybe maybe four. The first one's obvious. So, so you know, somewhere between 30 and 40 percent of Canadians are open to the idea of, of, of engaging in new talks uh, to deal with these issues. Um, but the other observations is first that the overall evenness, right? There's not a huge difference. Uh, there's nothing that stands out uh, as, as, as the biggest priority. There's nothing that falls off completely off the table. So that's the first thing. The second thing, which is not really shown here, is, is the count. So 30% of Canadians don't want to talk about any of these things in terms of constitutional talks. But 70% of Canadians want to talk about at least one of them, right? So I, I, I just conclude from that that I think it's not entirely accurate to say, you know, when we're talking about the public, uh, 
that no one wants to talk about the Constitution anymore, no one wants to restart the constitutional process and so on. Um, but the, the other, uh, I think, important point is I think the general overall lack of uh, divide um, between different parts of the population. Uh, and I'll try and illustrate that quickly. I'm going to say a lack of divide. I'm not trying to say there isn't one. Uh, I'm trying to say it's not astronomical. And that was really our purpose in as asking these questions. So you could, so I, I, I illustrated here just by showing the difference between Albertans and Francophone Quebecers. There's many different ways to show it, but I'm, I'm just boiling this down to a couple of, of issues. So yes, Albertans are more likely to want to talk about equalization than other Canadians, somewhat. Um, Quebecers are more likely to want to talk about the status of Quebec than other Canadians, somewhat, right? Um, also, I just find it curious that the biggest kind of, uh, the, the, the most, the item that is most likely to be named by Francophone Quebecers as a possible topic of constitutional talks is not the status of Quebec or the division of powers, but the monarchy, which is something I think we should keep in mind. Uh, and then this is just uh, on the same theme. Uh, the, the largest divide that there is is the, the divide uh, between in, uh, the proportion of Indigenous peoples in Canada who would want to restart constitutional talks on the topic of Indigenous rights and uh, non-Indigenous people. Um, I'll, let me, I can come back to that in the, in the discussion and so on. So I'm not saying there are not gaps, um, but it wasn't 80-20 uh, or 70-30. Okay, a couple more uh, aspects of, of this. So we asked a question that had been asked before on the importance to Canadians personally of Quebec signing the constitution. There was a preamble that sort of situated that, that question. Um, so it's of some importance to roughly one in two Canadians. There's a number of people undecided. So the number who don't feel it's important is, 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 is smaller than that. Again, our real interest here, I think, is, is uh, the extent or the absence of gaps. Right? And, and you can see here that there is actually not a significant gap between the view of Francophone Quebecers and other Canadians uh, on the question. And in fact, to the extent that there is a gap, it's, it's that you know people in Ontario, it's a little bit more important to people in Ontario than it is uh, to, to people in Quebec, although that's not a big difference. Um, this is not new. Uh, uh, to the extent that we have data from previous times when a similar question uh, was asked, um, uh, there also was not a gap. Uh, um, so, uh, and I am getting uh, close to the end. Uh, to the extent that there's differences that are interesting to note, uh, it's actually between age groups, less than rather than between national groups or between regional or uh, groups or, or, or provinces and so on. So there is, uh, there are age differences uh, in Quebec on these issues. There's actually age differences outside Quebec on other issues. So in the prairies, there's age difference in terms of interest in Senate, interest in equalization, and so on. Young people less interested. Um, but you can see that, that uh, the, there, there is a sort of a difference, for instance, between how young people outside Quebec, how much importance they attach to Quebec signatures versus young people inside Quebec at the moment. And then I think this is the last volet of information. Just get back to the role of the courts and uh, a quick word on the override. Um, so Canadians are generally more uh, comfortable with the Supreme Court having the final say uh, when there's a dispute between the courts and the parliament uh, than the parliament. Uh, and it doesn't really make much of a difference whether that's uh, pitched at the level of the federal parliament or provincial parliaments. When we get to the, the question of the override, should there be an override or not? Um, it's, a, it's a little less one-sided. And let me just, I'll, I'll, and this is, this is uh, my second, almost my uh, second last slide. So I'll, I'll wrap up very soon. Um, when surveys moved away from telephone where it was less easy to give an uncertain answer and onto online when it's easier to say uh, you don't know, the level of uncertainty on these questions goes way up. So that tells us something right away, right? That this is an issue that many Canadians have not decided about. That's important. But you can see that the that that move tended to take Canadians outside Quebec away from certainty that there should be some override. But it tended to take Francophone Quebecers away from certainty that there should not be. Right. So I think it's fair to say that within Quebec, uh, opinions on whether or not there should be an override are fairly evenly uh, 
divided. And then the last piece of information I'll show again is that um, uh, within that division, there is an important age difference in Quebec. Uh, so not only is there generally sort of unsettled uh, opinion on, on Section 33 in Quebec, um, uh, but uh, it also has a generational dimension. I guess my provocative way of saying that is, you know, some people speak of a consensus in Quebec around certain issues around, they you know, mentioned Bill 21, because that's obviously what we had in mind when we were asking those questions. Um, and and I, I, I don't think there's, uh, there's no evidence of a consensus. There's preponderances of opinion, uh, but preponderance is not the same as consensus. So I'll end on that and invite Alain now to come in and, uh, and provide some more uh, reflective uh, thoughts on all that. So thank you very much. Uh, just to pursue this, obviously, has been most instructive, and uh, and I share uh, all of the uh, the thoughts that have been uh, proposed by uh, by Andrew. Um, let me let me say first that uh, Andrew and I definitely have two set of lenses to appraise the current context. Uh, Andrew pays special attention to our opinion evolve through time, exploring the what's called trends, what's called tendencies. And then he appraises very correctly its implication for, I would say, for policy action. The main unit of analysis here is obviously responding to opinion polls. As for me and the way I, I try to complement Andrew's presentation is by bringing into the discussion a historical sociology standpoint with a view to assess how community and society are being shaped and transform through political action. And obviously the intention is to measure how the past contribute to shape the present and can give meaning to the future. So the latter position is normatively grounded and the unit of analysis is society or the political community itself. So Andrew and I do not pretend to have all the clues to understand the evolving Canadian constitutional development, but we feel that our respective sensitivities could open the way to some important consideration to revitalize a federal dynamics in the country. There are countless studies and reports that have been produced over the span of the four decades since the patriation of the Canadian Constitution. We can aggregate the bulk of these studies and report around three moments that inform us about the competing worldviews and concurrent political claims. So the moment one corresponds to the period of patriation to the mid-1980s. Moment two covers the period stretching from the tentative Mitch Lake Accord to the Charlottetown Accord and includes the constitutional battles associated with the 1995 referendum in Quebec up to the reference case on the right of Quebec to secede. And moment three covers the period from 2000 to the present years during which political leaders have launched a variety of policy initiatives to advance their own worldviews. So moment one, which uh, is being termed sorrow and enchantment, uh, I think is extremely important for us. The, mo the, nation, the notion of patriation here is associated in many mind of many Canadians to the moment when the country gained full constitutional control over its own political institution while entrenching a charter of rights and freedom that can provide protection to each and every citizen throughout the country. In 1982, Canadian were generally jubilant about this patriation after so many years of constitutional tension, although in many quarters, some expressed varying degrees of discomfort with the fact that first Quebec leaders in the National Assembly had not endorsed the political project. And two, Aboriginal leaders stayed away from the celebration arguing that their consent had not been obtained, let alone not even sought after by political authorities at the constitutional table. And third, Many women organizations felt that their own rights had not been taken seriously during most of the negotiation, so they arrived at the finish line with a feeling of bittersweet. Now, moment two is the years of potential constitutional redress or reconciliation, and this moment is a period during which the Charter of Rights and Freedom became a central tenet of the Canadian national project and as Alan Karens argued, contributed to defederalize the country by stressing individual rights rather than rights of the constituent nation. 
It's worth noting that over time, the Charter has been instrumental in changing the focus of attention away from First Minister's conference as the country's main power broker to action initiated by individuals through juridical activism. Our colleague Guy Laforet perceptively remarked that the 1982 Charter shifted the ground, and I, and I quote, of conflict drawing it out of the provincial confines and inserting it in a pan-Canadian legal and political arena where the Supreme Court, which is under the jurisdiction of the central state, is the court of final appeal, end of quote. Now, as a result of this major change, the two main pillars of federalism, namely provincial autonomy and the non-subordination of power, have been severely undermined. What we witnessed over these years have been, has been a growing transfer of political leadership from the member state to the central state and a standardization of rights protection. There's a lot of work here that has been done by jo Joseph Welling in, in defining these two dimensions. These two trends have contributed to consolidate a deeper sense of identification with the central state, fair enough, while attenuating the bounds between citizen and their own provincial institution. But we witness also during the second phase is a conception of rights, not so much as an expression of community rights and political aspiration and values, but rather as an expression of nation building. The continuing implementation of the new constitutional order in Canada has fed the idea that federalism could be viewed as an impediment to the protection of rights and even freedoms. As a result, political initiatives aim at decentralizing jurisdiction or standing up in favor of a role for the provinces in the protection of specific rights and freedom in various contexts are generally negatively perceived by Charter Canadian. The latter view the Charter as the primary source of social cohesion. Moment three, adhesion and integration, the importance of an ongoing constitutional deliberation. Moment 3 begins immediately after the reference case with regard to the right of Quebec to secession. The reference highlights four constitutional principles that by now we all know, democracy, federalism, the rule of law, and constitutionalism, and finally the protection of minority rights. Now the principle has been most effect the principle which has been most affected by the entrenchment of a new constitutional order in 1982 pertains to the undermining of the federal principle. Indeed, the emergent monist vision of the country pays only lip service for the role of minority nation as key constitutive component of the Canadian community. Since 1982, the central government has been much more prone to accommodate cultural diversity, for instance, multiculturalism, than national diversity. Some authors have suggested that with the establishment of a Royal Commission on Aboriginal People in 1991, Canada was initiating a new phase in its relation with the First People, a phase that would lead to a nation-to-nation -nation dynamic and open the way to the establishment of a multinational federation. Thirty years after its hearings, it has become clear that this commission, although not most important in sensitizing Canadians to unfair treatment and abuses suffered through time by members of the First People, did not fundamentally change the relation with the First Nations. Recent work by Robert Hamilton and Joshua Nichols, and we're going to hear tomorrow Joshua Nichols, as well as by Kiara Ladner, make the argument that recognition of First People claims are formulated by the state in a language that is congruent with a multicultural society and does not support the expression of any form of substantive sovereignty for the First People. And this is where I think we need to pay much more attention today. As a consequence, it is difficult to imagine where and how to begin implementing a policy that can contribute to a genuine process of decolonization and political emancipation. Thank you very much. Merci beaucoup, Alain. Je même pas eu besoin de sortir mes, mes petites cartes. This is great. It's, this leaves us uh, a good uh, 15, 20 minutes for, for discussion. Uh, for the audience, please file your questions in the, uh, in the chat function. Try to keep them relatively short and sharp um, and, uh, and we'll engage. But uh, maybe just to launch while we are waiting for, for the audience, um, 
and and I'll give you uh, maybe a chance each to to react to to the various presentations. But Penny, hearing seeing the disaggregation of data that we saw through the you know the the, the graphs that Andrew showed us and Alain's assessment of the incapacity in a way of post-patriation Canada to come to terms with strong internal nations or equal nations, uh, strong communities, um, and that the charter has possibly deforced this. Does that change the way you would qualify Canadians think this or thought that? or the kind of data that you would use or, or a source of information. And let me just ask you point blank, if, if we're only looking at what Anglophone newspapers are printing, are we getting a sense of what Canadians are thinking? Ab absolutely not. <laughs> <laughs> and so my, my um, uh, sloppy uh, suggestion. Oh, that I didn't Canadians mean that. <laughs> That's okay. Thought anything at all. Um, uh, I, you know, I think when you when you dig down into particular communities, you see um, uh, not only uh, different ways of um, embracing the Constitution, but different, uh, you, you know, levels of, uh, of interest in doing so. Um, and so, um, you know, to try to figure out, to try to get a handle on um, an evolving uh, constitutional culture, you know, does definitely um, uh, paint over um, all sorts of differences that uh, that exist, and 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 really undermines, um, you know, the capacity to say anything particularly um, general about what it is that's happening in that in that last, uh, you know, let's say the decade after patriation. Um, but I do think you can get a little bit of a, of a, you know, a little bit of a sense um, by looking at the sorts of things that, you know, what what's going on in schools and what is it that we're, we're teaching um, and how is that different after 1982 than it was before? Um, so while it's not necessarily something that you know everyone is embracing, it's it it you know does shift um, in in this case the constitution into a um, uh, you know into a much more public conversation, um, and and you probably you know move very quickly from from a conversation to the kinds of placards that you see uh, in the parliamentary district in Ottawa in, in January, the kind of, you know, misunderstandings and, and abuses. Um, because I think, you know, constitutional culture um, has an element of misunderstanding that is perhaps inherent in it. So uh, all, all I can say in a quick answer to your question is, there, there is no Canadian view, um, and and certainly uh, French language uh, universities, which I didn't look at, um, some of the French language press uh, I I had uh, included in a broad survey of what's going on in the sort of anniversary moments, um, but there will be different um, different perspectives, uh, you know, across the across the country. Um, from different uh, constituency groups and and at different times. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So it makes its way. The constitution makes its way to through schools, but perhaps not taught as it should. When we see the people calling for you know the defense of their First Amendment on uh, before or parliamentary hills, and one of my students said, "You real you know they don't realize that the First Amendment to the 1867 Constitution was the Man Manitoba Act." <laughs> Um, any reaction on this? And after that, I'll take a couple of questions from the chat. Andrew and, and Alain, did you want to react to this? Con well, this I point? will simply yeah. want to to, mm -hmm. to indicate that uh, Quebecers in particular, uh, contrary to what people have, uh, the view they have of Quebecers, have been always very supportive of the Charter of Rights and Freedoms. Uh, I, I Honestly, I have never read into a Quebecer Anglophone or Francophone, whatever communities, who is opposed to a Quebec Charter of Rights or a Canadian Charter of Rights. What the, the, the lack of comfort is the fact that the Canadian Charter capped the Quebec Charter of Rights and Freedom or is uh, 
uh, the Quebec Charter has to be interpreted through the Canadian Charter. This is where I think there could be some uh, discomfort. But with, in terms of rights and freedom, I think we are all on the same page. So I definitely want to make it clear to everyone who is uh, listening to us today. Well, we could have that conversation with the broad notwithstanding clause that is being invoked with certain major legislation right now. Um, you know, so it might be that there's support for the for the charter, but not for courts handling yeah. the charter. Um, but let me let me ask you. Um, uh, there was a question about the involvement of law, you know, or the large scale consultation processes before Charlottetown. So as a result you know, as a response to the closed door drama of Meech Lake, the idea that we should engage the public uh, and coast to coast consultations uh, in, in across cities, villages and so on. What what role did that play in developing this culture? And how do we explain sort of the lack of of, I would say, political engagement with the Constitution after that? There is a lot of perhaps affection for the charter and certainly a lot of instrumental, you know, it's used in the court system, uh, but it's not some, you know, engaging with the constitution is not something that's remained popular. So interestingly, like you pointed out, uh, Penny earlier, how Canada became sort of an exporter of constitutional design, of constitutional information, of constitutional expertise and so on and so forth. Uh, has not been learning a lot from elsewhere. Has been more exporter than importer, and the you know the 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 processes of public engagement with the constitution that we've seen across the world in constitution writing over the last fifteen years has not made a lot of inroads in in Canada. So how how do we explain this? Any of the three, if if you've got a. I hope I, I give credit to the first question in asking this. Yeah. Well, perhaps a word about mm -hmm. um, the influence of Canada worldwide. Obviously, uh, people have been looking for Canadian to uh, help them out. You know, we saw the Forum of Federation acting in different parts of the uh, in the world, in South Africa, uh, all over the place. They've been they've been they've been present. But they have tended not to bring in that many Quebecers or that many Aboriginal because the ideas that these people had to propose were not to be advanced to the same extent. Um, and it, we should also look at the fact that the there are people who are trying to use the Charter of Rights to, um, if not silence, at least to put in check claims made by minority nation. Even in the UK, during the last decade there's been a lot of people trying to advance a charter of rights for the uk and the idea was in fact to do what has been done in canada that perhaps with the charter of rights we will be in a position to individualize or autonomize uh, uh, canadian so that we are making claims in front of the state but as individual not as member not as a community so to speak and this is where i think we need to try to address that in a much better way and, and, and bring back communities that form the country with individual, obviously, but we need to find ways by which uh, we don't neutralize the two, but we combine, we find ways to either co-decision, or you know, we, we need to find a better way to uh, not uh, nullify the position, but to construct with, with position of individual and position of community. And this is the big challenge I think the country is, is facing and will be facing in the future. Mm -hmm. Andrew? Yeah, yeah uh, just uh, to follow in, in from that and, and you know, um, I, I understand why the reflection on the moment too that Alain described, which was the Meech and Charlatan moment was a sort of sense of exhaustion and and danger, right? That no one wants to go there. And and what I think I was trying to, you know, if I editorialize a little bit on the data, what I was trying to point to is 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 first of all, the public may be getting ahead of the, the political class a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, and and uh, I don't want to exaggerate that, but I think we should just be open-minded to that. 
but then if if I if I put my own cards on the table even more, I would say you know, the the reason I was pointing at that monarchy one is uh, uh, because that's before we have a change of monarch, right? That's that that the, the it it happens to be the issue that that people are, are most interested in talking about, and that and that's why why that's that's why we have a monarch that everyone is comfortable with. Uh, so uh, I I can't wait to see what that number looks like. Uh, when the unfortunate change of head of state happens, uh, and if we have no, and, and let me just add one more, you know, one more point, um, it's not going to be a simple thing because Canada is not a country where the idea of a single elected head of state through uh, fifty percent plus one is going to work. So, we whatever they did in Barbados and so on. Of which I'm not an expert about, but whatever it was, I, I doubt it's going to work here. Mm -hmm. So um, it's like it, the idea of just sort of letting this ability to talk to one another about what kind of country we are, and just letting that sort of atrophy is is uh, not in the long run uh, going to be a, a helpful approach. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I like the idea of uh, the the people being ahead of the of, of the political leadership on these things. I, I think that's true. And, and I often say to, well, to my students, you've been hearing since before your birth and, you know, your parents have heard that constitutional reform is impossible, futile, dangerous, divisive. We've tried it, doesn't work, move on. Um, and basically we hear that leitmotiv. And it's very, very strange, you know, again, from a comparative perspective to say that a com you know, modern democracy can basically say we've got an 18th, 19th century um, document, constitution in part that, you know, treats indigenous peoples as objects of legislation that we cannot modify. Um, but we'll teach the world about, about constitutional law. Um, and, and I find this very dis disheartening and undemocratic and not putting trust in young people in, in the capacity to talk. It would be very difficult, but the idea of not, you know, that we shouldn't be trying, I think is actually very problematic. And you can see people wanting to engage on different issues. I think that, you know, the figure you gave earlier of 70% of people thinking there's at least one issue that would warrant some constitutional tr transformation, I think is actually very, very interesting. Um, so the question is how we bring in this process of converse, constitutional conversation. And this allows me um, to, to uh, bring in um, another question that was asked. I'm trying to move on. Yes, uh, asked from an Indigenous person who is uh, anonymous, um, who is asking whether you have any ideas on how to change, change structures for engaging with Indigenous nations. So I guess it's the same question we've been talking about for the last five minutes, but how do we do it with Indigenous nations? What kinds of conversations, and more importantly, perhaps, what are the structures for having these conversations should we be thinking about? Anyone? The question was directed at Alain, but if anyone wishes well, to... Well, you know. well I, I think that uh, we definitely could, could welcome... Uh, Aboriginal leaders or leadership to to take the lead, so to speak. Uh, we look at the La Paix des Braves is probably one of the best example uh, uh, so that there was a discussion nation to nation, but it was coming from the leadership, uh, the leadership of the Cree speaking with the Quebec Premier. Uh, I think I think the initiative uh, could come that way. We see at Mastoyash, for instance, where they're trying to develop their own constitution, in fact, to write their own constitution. Uh, and then, uh, obviously, there will have to be a discussion, fair discussion between people in Mastoyash and people in, I guess, in Quebec City, uh, so that we converge with one another. Uh, with, so to write a constitution, it doesn't mean that we are trying to secede with one another. In fact, we're trying to speak to the other and put things give concept to to what we want to negotiate on. So I very much like the uh, the reference that Andrew made about the, the monarchy, because in fact, the at the end of this current era, uh, 
uh, there will there will be an obligation to reconsider what we want to do as Canadians. Do we want to keep this reference? And then we saw in in the uh, in the polls uh, that the monarchy doesn't have much support. But perhaps also for Quebec, this where there's a lot of support for the removal of the monarchy. Uh, probably more than anywhere else in the country, based on the polls, this could be also a bargaining chip uh, for uh, additional constitutional discussion. So that if we if we were to go along with this change, perhaps uh, uh, we need to revisit at the same time the uh, power sharing between province and the central state, or at least find a way to to give a a contour to the federal spending power so that these Ottawa cannot decide all the time what it wants with the money it raises from all Canadians. So I think their federalism also is, is at stake. I was actually surprised that only 50%, or maybe I misread the quote that 50% of, of Quebecois wanted to get rid of the monarchy. I, I bet it would have been much higher decades it, ago. It, it was it was just the proportion who wanted to reopen the constitution. Oh, to I have, see. Okay. Talked yeah. about yeah. it. So I'm sure and the of, other ones would like to get rid of it without reopening the constitution. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, and the monarchy, we could have a long debate about this because then we will have the conversation about the importance of the crown to indigenous people as a as a representative of the of the state and. Um, you know, it, it, which has a different symbolic uh, and constitutional value. Uh, another question is about, um, and again about public engagement, but um, the example given is uh, Alberta's equalization referendum of, uh, uh, I guess, the fall. Uh, was it in the fall? Or in the, yeah. yeah, it was in the fall. You know, Time you know. flies. It was in the fall. Um, and only 39% of eligible, el eligible voters actually cast their ballot. Um, what does that mean about engagement with constitutional issues, or does it not reflect constitutional matters at all, but only sort of local politics at, at that time? Well, I, I mean, I, I, I think the fact that it, the question was put through a municipal referendum provides the answer to the question. It, 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 it was not a genuine exercise in const, constitution making, constitution negotiation. Uh, it, it was it was a partisan tactic, um, and I think was was understood and perceived as as such. And and uh, so the voters who were on board with that were happy to give the premier their support, and and the, and the rest of the public understood that you know the it, it just didn't have that that kind of stake. So so I I, I mean I I personally take find that the, the exercise encouraging in that it shows the public can understand the concept of genuineness. <laughs> and um, and uh, and uh, and also just as a point of fact, I mean Albertans are continue to be supportive of equalization, ex, you know, et, et, et cetera, despite the result of that uh, that referendum. So so yeah, I, I I don't I don't think that was a test of a, you yes. know engagement around these types of discussions. Let's let's that that would be okay. my view. Excellent, thank you. I just got a message that we need to wrap this up to uh, to make space for the final uh, conversation. If uh, the audience doesn't know, Cheryl Saunders is giving a, a keynote uh, lecture after this. Uh, you will, you'll be in for a treat. She's absolutely ph phenomenal. Um, so thank you very, very much, uh, Penny, Andrew and Alain uh, for this, uh, for this conversation, uh, which I'm sure we could have carried on for another uh, little while. And possibly the next 40 years. So uh, we'll be looking forward to your papers. And, uh, and thank you. Thank you very much. Um, and thanks to the audience. Uh, if we could hear you, we would clap. So I will clap on my own. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. It was a pleasure. Thank, thank you, everyone.